I'm honored to be here today. And our theme for the next three weeks is the Gospel of Luke. And um, I really, I love this gospel. You know, it's interesting. We did John in December. And I wish we had more time with these gospels, frankly. But, uh, but the um, John is, is just one of my favorite books of the Bible. But I've got to say that there's something very special about Luke, and you're going to discover that today, I think, of how special, what, what a masterpiece of writing the Gospel of Luke is. Um, and you know that I've um, uh, urged you before to pray with open hands. And I do this because uh, God can take things out of our hands, and God can also put some new things into our hands. And I believe that this is a great way to, um, to, to grow in our faith is to give to God whatever is blocking us from him. So uh, if you're willing, would you pray with me with open hands and would you um, uh, join me in prayer? Just, just kind of maybe put your hands on your lap if you're willing to do it. And would you pray with me? Gracious God, as we open the doorway to this magnificent piece of literature and scripture, the Gospel of Luke, we pray that you would take out of our hands anything that would distract us or block us from getting all that you want to have us get out of this class. And I pray, oh God, that if there's any habits or resentment or bitterness or anger or something that is within us now that is preoccupying our mind and attention, would you put that on a shelf for us, oh God? And then may we be open to the new thing you have to say to us. So if there's anything you wanna put into our lives, a new habit, a new ritual, a new feeling, uh, new behavior patterns that you wanna put in, we pray we open our hands so we might be open to the new thing you have in store for us. Help us to learn not only a lot about the gospel of Luke and Luke's journeys and his person, but may we most of all learn about the person who Luke points to in this gospel, our living Lord Jesus Christ, whose passion, whose death, whose resurrection, we are celebrating this Lenten season. All this we pray, asking your blessing on this class and on Brentwood Presbyterian Church and the School of Christian Learning that we love so much. And we pray all this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. And may all God's people say, Amen. Um, I've got to tell you, I think there's a couple of... Um, Easterners on the screen today. I think maybe the uh, DeWalls are on the screen. Are you, if you, there they are. And the McBrides, I think maybe are here. Yes, there they are. So if you, if you see a couple of Eastern faces, that's okay. These are not Dodger fans, but they're Yankee fans and Philadelphia fans and so forth. So, uh, but I'm gonna actually work them into a little bit of my teaching on Luke today. Uh, so I really appreciate the DeWalls and the McBrides being here. But I want to start with just a quick quiz on Luke's gospel and the other gospels. Um, you all know these answers. So uh, just real quickly, uh, what was the gospel writer to Luke's profession? Do you remember? Anybody know? Nadia, you know. What is it? He was, a, he was supposed to be a, a doctor, a physician. He, he was a doctor or a physician. And what other book of the Bible did he write other than Luke? You all know this. Acts. 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 Yes. So Luke and Acts are kind of a two, two volume set. True or false? Chronologically, Luke's gospel was the first one written. Is that true or false? False. false. Well, what was first written? Mark. Mark. That's right. Mark was the first gospel. Then Luke and Matthew then John was last. Um, true or false? Mar Luke was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. Is that true or false? True. True. He was, a, and he's mentioned mm -hmm. in, we're going to refer to that today, in Colossians and Philemon and 2 Timothy. Some of the letters uh, Paul refers to Luke traveling with him. Um, true or false? The parables of the Good Samaritan and the prodigal son are only recorded in Matthew and Luke. Mark and John don't record them. Is that true or false? False. False. So uh, what's what's the truth? <laughs> only in Luke. Only in Luke. So Luke's the only one that wrote the prodigal son and the good Samaritan. That's very significant, as you'll see later. 
And then what author wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else? John, Paul, or Luke? Luke. Luke? Boy, this, you, you, I, I knew you'd get all of them, but uh, yes, Luke wrote the most. It's interesting. Paul, we, we think, wrote seven letters. Not all the letters in the Bible probably Paul wrote. He probably wrote 1 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Romans, Galatians, Philippians, Philemon. They're not as sure about, scholars aren't as sure about Ephesians. But even when you add up all the letters of Paul, Luke, in the Gospel of Luke and Acts, wrote more words than any other New Testament writer. So I've titled this class, um, Turning an Upside Down World Right Side Up. And I want to begin with a story you may have heard me tell, but it's one of my favorites, about William Temple, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, told the story of two vandals that broke into a shop in London in the middle of the night. They didn't steal anything, they didn't break anything, but what they did wrecked havoc in the shop. Do you know what they did? They rearranged all the price tags. <laughs> Next to the $20,000 mink coat, they put a $200 price tag. And next to the $200 sweater, they put a $20,000 price tag. And um, when they did that, uh, they, they had rearranged the price tags. Then they hid with a diabolical glee in the back of the store to see the faces on the unsuspecting shoppers who would come in and see all these price tags rearranged. Now, William Temple says an evil force has broken into God's world and rearranged all the price tags from the way God had them from the beginning of time. Next to the things God says are of inestimable value, like uh, family, lifelong friendships, prayer, having a relationship with God, serving someone else, sacrificing for someone else, loving someone, society or our culture often puts a low price tag next to those things God says are of inestimable value. Next to things God says are not that valuable, like power, prestige, popularity, success, our culture puts a high price tag. And William Temple says, our calling as Christians is to rearrange the price tags back the way they were meant to be from the beginning of time. In other words, to turn an upside down world right side up. Now, nowhere does that theme resonate more strongly than in the Gospel of Luke. Um, Luke really believes that something happened in the incarnation of Jesus Christ that was absolutely life-changing for the world, and that something happened in the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that changed human history, and that's why history is divide, you know, divided into two segments before Christ and after Christ. But something happened so significant that the world would never be the same again. And he, as you'll see in just a moment, Luke d builds this up in such a way that people really see the significance of the God of the universe becoming flesh and the passion of Jesus Christ. And so Luke is also saying that followers of Jesus Christ are meant to follow him and turn an upside down world right side up or rearrange God's price tags back the way they were meant to be from the beginning of time. Now, just a quick word, Mark and Matthew were writing to Jewish audiences. So their focus is so often on Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, the fulfillment of Jewish prophecy. So right at the beginning of Matthew in, in chapter one, he begins with the genealogy of, of Jesus Christ but he traces the genealogy back to Abraham, kind of the father of the Jewish faith. And Matthew also puts um, the, all the teaching of Jesus in one, in one fell swoop, in one three chapter segment, Matthew chapter five, six, and seven in Matthew called the Sermon on the Mount. He takes all the teaching of Jesus and puts it in one place uh, as if he was teaching it all at one time. But it's a very effective way to get all this this filet mignon of his teaching in one place. Mark um, was very familiar. He, he really understood uh, the, the way people lived in Jesus' day. And the little houses were so close to one another, the little houses with thatched roofs and so forth, that they lived very close to one another. If somebody sneezed in one house, you, you said Gesundheit in the next house. So people were very close. Everybody was aware of everybody else's business. 
And Mark uses the word immediately over and over and over again. It's like Mark is breathless. He's, he's uh, telling the stories of Jesus and then he's, um, he's baptized and immediately he's thrust out into the wilderness. He's tempted by the devil and immediately calls his disciples. Everything happens quickly. And it's like when you go to these villages, somebody's healed and everybody knows about it. And, and that's kind of the way it was. Every, oh, the word spread quickly, but Mark gives us a breathless account. But both Mark and Matthew are trying to show the Jewishness of Jesus and that he is the Jewish Messiah. John, as we learned in December, is focused on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. John tells his readers in chapter 20, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So he wants everybody to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Earl Palmer, uh, a friend of mine and a great scholar and pastor, wrote a book called The Intimate Gospel on the Gospel of John. And John is very intimate, as you remember, in December. And you remember how in John, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. I'm the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection of life. What G and what John is saying is what happened, what Jesus did in one time and place, bringing light into a tough, dark situation or feeding people is what Jesus does in every situation. He's always the light of the world. He's always the bread of life. He's always the resurrection. He's resurrecting marriages and resurrecting relationships and resurrecting churches. He's resurrecting Jesus and he's resurrecting us. But what happened in one time and place is happening all over. But, but something unique about Luke's gospel is this turning an upside down world right side up. Luke is calling the followers of Jesus to radical discipleship. In fact, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and William Temple, Temple and scholars throughout history have said the Magnificat in chapter one in Luke is the, is the most radical revolutionary passage in all of the Bible. Now, that's quite a statement. When, when Mary talks about um, how God has blessed her, but he's, he's turning the tables back right side up again. And we'll, we're going to look at that in a minute. So what is radical discipleship in Luke? It's loving those who are difficult to love. It's having table fellowship with people we may not want to be with. And you'll see Luke uh, is, brings lots of people to the table. He's always, um, has Jesus always sitting with people and having a meal with them. And he talks about the poor and the rich. And Luke really redefines poverty and redefines wealth. And so in the stories of the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son, you have what I think what Luke thinks of is radical discipleship. A rad this is a radical message that he's giving in these passages. And then in Luke 19, uh, he includes the story of Zacchaeus. And nobody else includes the story of Zacchaeus, where this tax collector who's very rich has a radical reorientation of his life. And his upside down world is turned right side up. And he devotes his life to turning an upside down world right side up. So we're going to see all this in Luke, how he's calling followers of Jesus to live against the grain of the culture and to rearrange the price tags. Um, on your sheet in red on the first uh, page, I put this quotation from Eugene Peterson. And um, I would urge you to, if you ever would buy the message, it's a great, it's a, a translation somewhat of a paraphrase, but, but Peterson took the original Greek and Hebrew and translated it into English. But the, the, what I want to emphasize is the, the uh, introductory chapters of the books, the introductory words of the books are like scripture themselves. It's unbelievable how uh, cogent and, and inspiring they are. And this is the introduction to his uh, book of Acts that uh, is, of course, also written by Luke. And he calls it, are we spectators to Jesus or are we in on the action of God? And this is his introduction to what Luke wrote in Acts. Because the story of Jesus is so impressive, there is a danger that we will be impressed, but only impressed. As the spectacular dimensions of this story dawn on us, we could easily become enthusiastic spectators and then let it go at that. 
we could become admirers of Jesus, generous with our oohs and ahs, and in our better moments, inspired to imitate him. It is Luke's task to prevent us from becoming mere spectators to Jesus, fans of the message. The story of Jesus does not end with Jesus. It continues in the lives of those who believe in him. The supernatural does not stop with Jesus. Luke makes it clear that these Christians he wrote about in Acts were no more spectators of Jesus than Jesus was a spectator of God. They are in on the action of God, God acting in them, God living in them, which also means, of course, in us. So what I'm getting at is, Luke, this is not a theoretical gospel about somebody else. So that we'll say, oh, isn't Jesus wonderful? He does want us to say that, but he wants us to know that we can be in on the action of God, that God can actually work in our lives. So you might remember one Sunday in a sermon at Brentwood some months ago, I contrasted WWJD and WIJD. What would Jesus do, WWJD? I said, well, the problem I have with that, I love that wristband, the problem I have is, I can't do what Jesus did. And I get upset with myself when I don't love as Jesus loved and don't serve people as Jesus did. And so sometimes WWJD can be discouraging. But these words mean a lot to me, W-I-J-D, what is Jesus doing? Because what that means to me is that God's already at work in a situation. And what I, what I wanna do is get in tune with what God is doing uh, that's already going on. So I always believe we're getting on a moving train. Like when Laura East, uh, two years ago, it hardly seems possible, came to Brentwood Prez, she got on a moving train, a train that God's already been at work there. When Dave Carpenter came years ago, he got on a moving train. The train's already moving. God's already at work in every situation. So when I prayed this morning for this class, I prayed, you know, God, can I get in tune with your will? That's why I pray with open hands. Can I get in tune with your will rather than just insisting on my will, what I want them to know about Luke, Lord, would you speak through me what, what you want them to get? And that's been life-changing for me. What is Jesus doing? Get in tune with what Jesus is doing. And this is what Luke says in his gospel. Um, so uh, under the, um, at the very bottom of the page, this is my little assignment during the next, the next three weeks between now and Easter, is I'd love you to reflect on these questions. Do you wanna be a spectator of Jesus? Or do you want to be in on the action of God? And if you want to be in on the action of God, what would it mean for you to be in on the action of God? Or in other words, a conduit of God's love to others. I'd love you to reflect on that. Would you like to be in on God's action? And what would that mean for you? Secondly, I'd love you to reflect on what are the price tags, the value system in our culture that's out of sync with God's value system? That could be, that question could be the whole class here. So where is our culture's value system or the way our culture defines success? How is that out of sync with the way God defines success? You remember the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, George Bailey, um, you know, you know he, the town could have been called Pottersville had he not been there, but it was New, New Bedford in New York. And uh, Bailey uh, realizes that... Um, the whole town would have been out of sync had he not been there. He made such a difference. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Do you want to make the kind of impact in your local community that George Bailey realized he made in his community? And, you know, they said George Bailey, the, the richest man in town. Well, they said that when he was kind of bankrupt, but he was the richest man in town because he had lots of friends. He redefined the price tags. He rearranged God's price tags. Um, and then where do you feel a sense of call to, to turn an upside down world right side up? And then finally, are you willing to accept my Lenten challenge? I'd love you to read a, God, a chapter a day of the Gospel of Luke. If you read it for the next 24 days, you would finish on the Tuesday of Holy Week and you'd have a couple of days to, um, to get ready for Easter and maybe even go back over Luke and see what's going on there. So if you're willing to accept my Lenten challenge, uh, a chapter a day of Luke for the next 24 days, I'm telling you, it's life-changing. So, uh, and, and also you'll get a sense of, I think, of what it means to be in on the action of God instead of a mere spectator Christian. So uh, I'm gonna ask you at the end if you're willing to do that, but I hope you'll consider one chapter a day for the next 24 days 
it will be life-changing as reading a chapter of John a day for the 21 days was life-changing. Um, what I'd like to do is look at the second page and there's five things about Luke that I wanna just quickly review before we get into some case studies of what's happening in this gospel. Um, and the five things about Luke I'd love you to know, uh, and each, each time I'm gonna share some principles about Luke. The first principle is Luke is a historian who puts Jesus' life and ministry in a broader world context. Uh, the Luke is not saying once upon a time. He's not telling a fairy tale. What Luke wants us to know is this story about Jesus Christ really happened. And so he goes out of his way to say, in those days, the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. He wants us to know that Jesus actually appeared within human history, or in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar as emperor, and then he goes on to, with what he's, he's discussing about Luke, about the Jesus. But Luke wants us to know there's a broader world context here. Two questions that always appeared for the early Christians. Number one is, is Christianity simply a sect within Judaism? And secondly, do you have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. And what both Paul and Luke, and they were traveling companions, wanted people to know is that Christianity is not a Jewish sect. It's, it's a whole truth in and of itself. It's the fulfillment of Judaism. And also that, that the Christian faith, Jesus existed within a broader world context than we could ever imagine. So both Paul and Luke go out of their way to show the world context that Jesus is operating in. Uh, and notice that Luke's references in here, when you read through these 24 chapters, as I hope you will, Luke doesn't just refer to the Jewish festivals of Passover, Tabernacles, Pentecost, Passover, as Matthew and Mark do. Uh, he really goes out of his way to show the broader context. Uh, secondly, and there's, there's so much to say about Luke, but secondly, Luke is a vigorous champion of the outsider. He goes out of his way to show that, um, that, that God is God's love is inclusive. It's not exclusive. And it, I put in here in, under number two in red, in the, from the introduction of the gospel of Luke, what Eugene Peterson said, uh, about that, and it's it's fabulous. Luke is a vigorous champion of the outsider. An outsider himself, the only Gentile in an all Jewish cast of New Testament writers, he shows how Jesus includes those who were typically treated as outsiders by the religious establishment of the day. Women, shepherds, common laborers, the racially different, the Samaritans, and the poor. Luke will not countenance religion as a club, as Luke tells the story, all of us who have found ourselves on the outside looking in and who of us hasn't felt it, now find the doors wide open, found and welcomed in Jesus. Have you ever in college tried to get in a fraternity or sorority and you got in or you didn't get in? <laughs> You're an insider or an outsider. Have you ever felt at a church, not Brentwood Presbyterian, but at some church where you were on the outside or the inside? Have you ever felt in the neighborhood? There's a little group, and you know what I mean by that. You're either on the inside of the group or you're on the outside of the group. Have you ever felt included or excluded? Well, this is all, you know, sadly, the church, the religious history has had a terrible record of excluding people. And and saying, no admittance here, you're not welcome here. And what Luke's gospel is really all about is saying, uh, are we open to one more? Is the door open? Well, are we willing to make room for the outsider or not? And so some of Luke's like, it was absolutely unbelievable that Luke included the shepherds in the revelation of God's son being born. Nobody would have thought, the, the, the respectable Jews wouldn't have thought that a shepherd would be included in God's revelation because shepherds were dirty. They, they couldn't 
obey food laws and ceremonial cleansing laws. So they were excluded from the temple and from the fellowship because they were they were doing a dirty job. Well, they didn't have time to, they had to care of the sheep. They, they couldn't have time to wash their hands and, and be ceremonial clean and keep with the food laws. But, but Luke includes them. There's a poem that is one of my absolute favorites. I hope you know it. It's by Edwin Markham. It's so simple and so uh, brief, but it's power packed. Edwin Markham, the poem is called Outwitted. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. The question of Luke's gospel is, are we shutting everybody out, those who don't agree with us, or are we letting people in and Luke will not countenance religion as a club. He shows you how Jesus is inclusive, not exclusive. That's a huge theme in this gospel. And you're going to see it again and again and again. Who's insiders? Who's outsiders? Um, and by the way, that's all included in the book of Acts, too. That's what Acts is all about. Then in the principle three, Luke and Acts are two volumes uh, written to one audience. Luke says in the beginning of his gospel, um, right in chapter one, since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided after investigating everything very carefully from the very first to write an orderly account for you most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning these things about which you have been instructed. So Luke is saying there, he's not an eyewitness to Jesus. He wasn't one of the 12 disciples, but he did do a very orderly account and he did research. He investigated, he thought it through carefully, and he decided to write an orderly account. So who is Theophilus? Theophilus literally means, uh, in Greek, theo, phileo, lover of God, theo, philia, lover of God. Or uh, Theophilus could have been a Roman um, uh, bureaucrat, a Roman leader. And, um, but he's writing this very orderly account. And then in the book of Acts, in the beginning of Acts, he says, in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles. And then he continues there that now he's gonna continue the story of what the followers of Jesus did. But he tells Theophilus that he wrote the first book to show what Jesus did. Now he's writing a second book to show what Jesus' followers did. So we don't know who Theophilus was, whether he's a Roman bureaucrat or leader, or is it written to all Christians? But what we do learn is, Luke is not an eyewitness, but he did lots of investigative reporting. And because he's a doctor, as Nadia told us, he has great attentiveness to detail. Luke is a clinical observer of the school of life. And it's so interesting that doctors are often good writers because they do such thorough research. People like Somerset Maugham, Walker Percy, John Keats, Robert Browning, Anton Chekhov, they are all doctors, but they're also excellent, outstanding writers. We could go on and on on this, but I put at the end of that, that's a couple of passages for you to read uh, in, the, in the New Testament and Paul's letters about where Luke was a traveling companion of Paul. And I think some of the investigation Luke did was not only from Mark's gospel, but from a source called Q, and Q uh, means quell, Q-U-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, which means uh, scroll. So the idea is that, uh, or, or source, the idea that, um, that Luke looked at lots of sources about Jesus before he did his writing. But I think when he spent time with people like the apostle Paul and like Peter and like James and like others in the early church, he was pumping them for information and I think he took all this stuff, put it together as a doctor would do, and then very surgically, with attentiveness to detail, got everything ready to write this gospel so it's an orderly account. 
The uh, fourth thing I would want you to know about Luke. Yes, sorry. Just a, a couple of questions. One, is it thought that Luke traveled with Paul when Paul returned to Jerusalem to speak with the apostles and thus the apostles could be a source? Second, is the name Theophilus possibly a pseudonym because of the potentially seditious conduct content of the two books? Wow, these are great questions. Uh, yes, it is thought that that Luke traveled with Paul to Jerusalem. Now, it's funny, we don't have empirical proof of that, but it seems like he did travel to Jerusalem and that talking to James and to Peter would have been a great source for him of his material. Uh, I, I think that's a very astute uh, thought. And yes, I think, I think that, um, that inclusion of, of Theophilus because of the sedition is a really interesting, I mean, that's a whole something we could debate, but I think it's a very interesting thought. I, I think you're right about that. I think he, I, I think Luke was wondering um, to what degree his, this material would be, um, would be radical and revolutionary and would, did people worry about him, Jesus trying to overthrow, or followers of Jesus trying to overthrow the government? And actually, you know, as you know, later on, the Christians were so persecuted because Rome was actually threatened by them. And that's why Nero and others cut out the tongues of Christians so they couldn't speak and cut off the ears of Christians so they couldn't hear because they were threatened like hell, frankly, <laughs> that these Christians could take over the world. And this and, and so, you know, it's funny, Hall and others, um, so often we as Christians don't always notice the radical revolutionary nature of our faith. But one of the things in, in Luke are gonna notice is the demons know it. In fact, when Jesus is casting out the demons, they the demons say, we know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth. You are the son of God. And I often think, do we know what the demons know? And the Roman government realized, man, if this stuff ever gets out, we, if, if, Caesar is really just a little piece of lint on the page of history. And this Jesus is really the sovereign. Wow. I mean, our whole system of government is in jeopardy. So I think that's very astute observation. So it's interesting that this is really a radical life-changing message. Any other comments at this point? Anybody want to make this a 10-week class? There's so much... Anyway, uh, Dave and Laura are laughing. They, they know I can keep going forever. <laughs> forever. But uh, I want to get to two other points and a couple of texts here and then see what questions you have. I also want to just remember that Luke is a literary uh, artist who organizes material. He's making a statement. So whenever you read this, ask yourself, why did Luke put the stories of Jesus together in the way he did? Why did he do that? And what's he saying when he differs from Mark or Matthew? We're going to see some examples today why he differed so radically from what Mark and, and Matthew did. Why did he do that? So ask yourself that. What's he trying to say to us? Um, Jerome wrote the Latin Vulgate in the fourth century. And, and uh, Jerome said Luke was the most skilled writer of all the evangelists. Jerome wrote little theological commentaries on the various books. But, but notice that... Um, Luke took all this research, all these interviews with people, all the reading he did, and funneled it into his gospel. And there's a, it, one of the things I most love about Luke's writing, I'm going to see this in just a minute, he produces anticipation. You know, I, I work at being a good speaker and preacher. I, I work at it. And I work with lots of young preachers, frankly, now it's, it's kind of my calling in this stage of my life. I, I, I work with young preachers who want to get better. They're all good, but they want to get better. They want to become great preachers. And the thing that's so interesting about speaking or writing is anticipation. If you can get a listener to anticipate what you're going to say next, man, you've, you've, you've got it. So if you're, if you're hook into the sermon or into the class or whatever it is, is um, 
is strong enough, you, people stay with you. If it's not, they'll wander off. Uh, but but the point is that, that, that this is what I so love about Luke's writing is he he anticipates what's going to come next, and he he puts the setting in so he makes it so provocative that you want to stay with him. And we're going to get to a little bit more of that. And one other thing I want to say about Luke, and then we're going to get into these three texts, which kind of kind of show some of what I'm thinking. Just remember that Luke was intended not to be read aloud, not to be read, but to be to be heard. In other words, it wasn't no, you know, in those the early church, people didn't have the scriptures exactly. The scriptures, like when Jesus read in the um, in the synagogue, it was only the the individual synagogues that had these scrolls of scriptures. But individual Christians didn't have the Bible. I mean, we 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 don't always think about that. That 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 these stories were written down to be heard, not read. So. Um, when, when the D. Walls and McBrides who are here from the East, they've heard me speak at Ocean Grove. I've done classes at Ocean Grove Monday through Friday after preaching on Sunday. And I once did one on Philippians. And instead of teaching Philippians at the end of the first class, instead of going on longer, I said, so I want to read the, the book, but I want you all to get out of your places, leave your purses and your your everything, your Bibles and everything at your place and come up around me. Uh, and they did that. And then I really got the idea that maybe I should come out of the water. So one day I went to the Atlantic Ocean and walked along the water and everybody was up on the uh, boardwalk. I don't know if you all remember this up on the boardwalk. And I walked in as if I was the Apostle Paul, I was dressed like him. And I, and I spoke the letter to them that would have come from Paul on the ship. Because what I wanted them to get was the fact that this is an oral tradition. It's not written. It's not, you know, we don't look at every word. We, we hear it and we see it. We, we see it in our mind's eye. And people literally leaned in. And there's a passage in Philippians where two women in the church are not getting along, Eudia and Syntyche. And Paul says that I urge Eudia and Syntyche to start to get along. And it would be like, uh, you know, if I said, uh, I urge uh, Carol and Ruth to give up your differences and get along. Well, you know, they were sitting right there and I pointed to two of the women in the group and you could have heard a pin drop. It was so different to hear it than to see it. Anyway, just remember these are, th these are, this is, uh, writ was written to be heard, not seen. So what I was suggesting is when you read this gospel, what about reading it aloud? Or uh, if you're reading with a, your, your spouse or a partner or a friend, what if you would read to them and then they would read to you? So you, you get yourself in the habit of hearing it as opposed to simply just looking at it. Um, I'd like to look at, if we can, at three quick texts, three, three quick case studies. Uh, and by the way, there's an error in the document about um, Gutenberg uh, movable type was really in the 1450s. It's more 600 years than 700 years. I just did that to test you to see if you knew. But uh, um, I'd like to look at three quick case studies. I'd like you to look at, at, uh, at Luke chapter one for just a minute. And here's what I want to say. If you would read Matthew 1, 18, first of all, Luke, I mean, Mark and John do not include a birth narrative of Jesus. John, remember, talks about the word becoming flesh, the logos, but John doesn't have a birth narrative, neither does Mark. Mark just starts with the with the, the John the Baptist and, and Jesus, the call of the disciples, but doesn't mention the birth of Jesus. Matthew gets into it in this way, not until verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be the child of the Holy Spirit. He just starts right off. The birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. But notice the difference in Luke. Luke, right after those first four verses I read to you, Luke is going to have seven little narratives about the birth and the childhood of Jesus that are not recorded anywhere else. So Luke is starting like he's telling a story. He's setting a narrative in a context that, first of all, he starts with 
that, that John the Baptist had parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and Zechariah is a priest. He goes into the temple uh, and the angel says to him, you're going to have a child. And he and Elizabeth, they're, they're in their old age. And Zechariah doesn't believe the angel, doesn't believe what's being told him. And therefore he becomes mute, he becomes speechless. You'll notice that when Luke talks about Mary, when the angel tells him, Mary, you're gonna have a child, she believes. So here's an old man who doesn't believe, a young woman who does believe. And here's Zechariah who becomes moot and Mary who can't stop talking in the Magnificat. There's these contra, it's a, it's a fabulous way to get into the story. And, but it's all the background on John the Baptist's parents and how they, they're really cousins, John the Baptist and Jesus. And Mary and Elizabeth uh, have a great relationship in an advent, uh, Dave and Laura and I preached on these texts of where Elizabeth and Mary comforted one another in their pregnancy. And because Mary was an outcast because she was a child of 14 or 15 at becoming pregnant. And uh, you know who would have believed the child was of the Holy Spirit? So uh, Mary makes her way out of Dodge to go, to go down to see Elizabeth. And she stays there for three months. And these two women talk about the, the uh, sons that they're going to give birth to and wondering about who, who they really are. You know, Elizabeth realizes her son is special. Mary realizes her son is special, but they, they help. Imagine with a the conversation, they help one another. Luke includes all this. And isn't it interesting that God uh, entrusted the care of God's son to Mary? a young woman, a teenager. And I, and, and I, one of the uh, young women in our group uh, began her sermon the other day about Jesus by saying this, he learned all this from his mother. And she got a great sermon on what Mary might have taught Jesus about uh, caring for the poor, caring for the outcast. And it grew out, all this grew out, it was, she was preaching on the Magnificat, but it was it was an amazing message. But you see the way Luke's uh, artistry in this story. So then when he gets to Luke 1, um, 26, he's talking about in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. He came to her and said, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what kind of greeting this might be. Like, are you talking to me? I mean, <laughs> what, are you, what are you up to here? And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Look at this language. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Man, oh man. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child that will be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived. And this is the sixth month. For her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And get this, Mary hears all this. Now remember, Mary's probably 14 years old. Imagine this. And Mary said, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Can you even imagine what this girl was processing? That she's going to be the mother of, this, of the most high God. He's going to be the son of God. And then Mary gets out of town, goes to visit Elizabeth and so forth. And then she says, as she's talking to Elizabeth, she, re she realizes a lot of who this child is going to be. And she says in verse 46, my soul magnifies the Lord for my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For God has looked with favor on the lowliness, the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, 
and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly and has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. In other words, he's rearranging all the price tags. And who says this? This 14 year old girl to whom God entrusts the, the savior of the world to her care. You see why Bonhoeffer says, these are the most revolutionary words ever written. And Bonhoeffer was trying to get rid of Adolf Hitler. He knew about, about the, the, the success in terms of the eyes of the world. He knew about the power of the world, but he said God is overturning the tables. And then if you read through this whole section, the first couple of chapters of Luke, um, it's so interesting the way Luke builds this up. And then just two other things from Luke two, uh, in, in Luke 2, chapter 1, this is what I'm talking about. In those days, the decree went out for member Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first registration while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And then he tells about how they, they traveled to Bethlehem. And then verse 8, in that region, there were shepherds living in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. An angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said to them, what the angel said to Mary, do not be afraid for I'm bringing you good news of great joy, which will come to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign unto you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly host saying, praising God and saying, glory to God of the highest. And then when the angel, when the angel leaves, the shepherds go over to Bethlehem to see this thing that's happened. They went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known to them all that had been told them about this child, that the child's going to be the son of the most high God. So Mary's saying, gosh, the angel speaks to me. Now the angel's speaking to the shepherds. Now the shepherds have come to me. And she's realizing more and more, wow, this is really something. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But notice this, Mary treasures all these words and pondered them in her heart. In other words, it is true. Whew. Then Luke continues. I mean, this is like great, tremendous writing. And then I just want to see one little vignette. So he, he um, Jesus is born, Mary and Joseph are raising him in Nazareth. In verse 40, Luke 2, verse 40, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was with him. Nobody else includes anything about Jesus' childhood. But now we have this little vignette from Luke. He's the only one who includes this. Now, every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival had ended, they started to return. And the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know it. Now, people always say, were his parents bad parents or were they neglecting? No, people traveled in caravans. And so just like um, at the beach, you know, you might be have two young children. They might go to a family nearby you and start making a sandcastle. You're not bad parents if you don't know where they are every second, because they may be right down the beach uh, making a sandcastle. So they may have been traveling with somebody else, but they didn't know he was traveling with somebody else. But people did that all the time. Children played with other children. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. And imagine how desperate they would be, by the way. After three days, they found him in the temple sitting. Imagine three days they're looking for him. After three days, they find him sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. After all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, child, why have you treated like this, us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you with great anxiety. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he said to them. Then he went back with them to Nazareth and was obedient to them. This is he was obedient to them. This is the son of God now. He's obedient to this mother and father. And his mother, Mary, treasured all these things in her heart. And then Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. But you, you get a little, Luke gives us this vignette into Mary. She hears the angel. She believes it. The shepherds confirm it. 
and now and now uh, he's in a temple and they're realizing this guy's really got a lot of understanding and she's treasuring all these things in her heart. And I think Mary throughout her whole life treasured all these things in her heart. Um, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? Look at the difference in what Luke does in chapter one and two. No other writer in the New Testament. Mark doesn't do it. John doesn't do it. Matthew doesn't do it. He gives us all these little vignettes so we can appreciate the fact that the son of God became incarnate and dwelt among us. It's breathtaking. Um, <laughs> do, do you get the idea that I like this, Luke? Sorry. No, not at all. You're very indifferent, obviously. Um, <laughs> does this um, uh, focus of Luke heightened likelihood that Mary is a source for Luke? Wow. Um, what an interesting, I mean, I, I think certainly, we, you know, I think certainly he got from her, from people who knew her. You know, he, he, the early church was a community, a very tight-knit community. So he would have gotten from others, certainly, what Mary thought about these things. You know, where did he get these stories? So, uh, certainly Mary would have told someone about this and the early Christian community was the keepers. They, they, didn't have, they didn't write all this down. They were keepers of these, this oral tradition, these stories. So yes, I think he did get it from, from someone certainly who knew her and heard these stories. Well, isn't the, isn't the early community tradition that um, Mary uh, survived for at least a part of John's lifespan and John is, is uh, by tradition, uh, believed to have lived a long time. Yes. Which suggests to me, for, for example, I, I hadn't put these two ideas together, but if Luke goes with Paul to Jerusalem, at that yes. time, Mary is still in Jerusalem. Yes. Subs you... Subsequently, Mary uh, is under the care of John, who has now gone to yes. um, Ephesus and so on. Yeah. Uh, you what you don't. Sorry. No, no what, what I was going to say is that's, that's very, very possible. What The thing about Paul's visit to Jerusalem is that he was under a lot of attack. He was being criticized. And um, he says in Galatians that he, uh, he only met with Peter and James because he didn't want to be perceived as trying to influence, because Jerusalem, you know, is the mother church. He didn't want to have be perceived as trying to influence them and get them on his side. So he only meets with Peter and James so that they can, so that he can get their blessing to go out and do this missionary work. So the question is, was Luke with him? But if he was, maybe Luke only met with, with Peter and James also, or did, did, um, did he have an opportunity to meet with more people? Did Luke have an opportunity to meet with more people? That's one of those things we don't know. But it's, so it's interesting to try to piece this all together. Um, Laura, I know I'm running out of time. You have um, three minutes. Okay, good. So uh, let, me, let me give you 20 minutes worth of stuff in three minutes. Um, so... I think the best thing to do would be maybe to save uh, this little vignette of Peter till next time. But I do want you to see this, this astounding in Luke chapter four. Um, notice the difference in Luke chapter four, verse 16. You're going to read this, that um, Jesus comes to Nazareth and speaks in the synagogue. Mark tells this story that, uh, that he taught in the synagogue. But just, he, he doesn't get into the details. He just, you'll, you'll read Mark chapter 6, 1 to 6. Mark is just telling uh, a very general vignette that um, he's a prophet without honor in his own hometown. But Luke doesn't give, Mark doesn't give you the background as to why. Luke, if you read verse 16 and following, he mentions that uh, on the Sabbath day, Jesus is in, he goes to the Sabbath, to the synagogue on the Sabbath, as is his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, found the place where it was written in Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, the rearranging of the price tags. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, 
to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's on the scroll. So he rolls up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Notice how Luke does this. He stands up, unrolls the scroll, goes to the place. When he's finished, he rolls it back up, gives it back to the attendant, sits down. That's all part of Luke's writing, his brilliance, and is all orderly. And the eyes of all in the synagogue are fixed on him. Notice the drama here. It doesn't just give you the answer. It gives you anticipation. The eyes of all in the synagogue are fixed on him. And then he began to say to him, then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I'm telling you, that would have been like punching them in the guts, in the solar plexus. What he's saying is, this is a messianic text of a, the Messiah who's going to come. And what he said to his hometown is, I'm the Messiah. Well, it was shocking because he, you know, hey, wait a minute, isn't this, you know, it's like Billy Graham coming to his hometown. Isn't this Billy? We saw him playing kickball and baseball out in the yard. Who is, who is this guy? Well, th you know, they knew him as a little boy. And, and then if you read further, he suggests that, um, that uh, the grace of God extends beyond Israel. And when they realize that he thinks he's the Messiah, and the grace of God is not just for people in Israel, but people in Syria, of all places, Naaman the Syrian is healed of leprosy. Well, this is too much for them. And you'll, as you read further in this text, they want to kill him. And I went to the cliff that it's a, I'm telling you, it's a very high cliff in Israel. And they want to push him off and kill him because what he's saying threatens them. So I just close with this thought that this to follow Jesus is the most radical revolutionary thing you could ever do. You might find yourself believing he's the son of God. You might find yourself believing that he actually wants you to dine at table with your enemies, that he might want you to care for your enemies, that he might want you to actually rearrange the price tags of your neighborhood and the value system of your neighborhood Jesus might actually even send you out into the deepest water you could ever, ever, ever imagine. And you're out there in deep water without a life preserver, and all you've got to trust on is Jesus. So uh, I'm going to end with that, but to say that Luke's gospel, if you'll read for next week, the first eight chapters, start today after church and read a chapter and do it tomorrow and through next Sunday morning. And then we're going to talk about more about Luke next week. Uh, Laura, I wish we had another half hour, but uh, that's enough for today. Did I whet your appetite to read? How many are willing to read a chapter a day of Luke for the next 24 days? Are you willing? Okay.